<laughs> okay, so it's time to start. Welcome everybody to our PLS 2022 conference prelude uh, number two session. And um, yeah, it's our pleasure and honor to have Nicole and Sven here to introduce the combined use of partial least square structural equation modeling, PLS SEM, and the necessary condition analysis, NCA. Before we get a little bit into the topic, um, just one or two words. Uh, as you know, we planned to have another PLS conference uh, in Beijing in May last year, but uh, for the known uh, yeah, instances, uh, we have to postpone the conference. And the main conference will now take place uh, at the end of October 2022. So there's a lot of time still um, ahead of us. And in order to entertain ourselves in between, we decided to schedule um, these uh, prelude sessions. And we started with prelude session number one on predictive model assessment um, a while ago. And uh, today we have prelude session number two, which is on PLS SEM and NCA. In, uh, in October, uh, at October 27 this year, we plan to go on with prelude session number three before in April, May 22, um, the last and the fourth prelude session will follow. Today, um, Nicole and Sven will address um, a yeah, super interesting topic in PLS SEM. Of course, it allows us to further substantiate the structural model and the structural model relationships. So what we are looking at is necessity thinking. And this is relevant um, because um, we have many, many situations where we um, come with a claim that uh, A is a necessary condition for B or B requires A and alike. And the necessary condition analysis is a useful tool to further identify and support um, the necessary conditions and uh, therefore it's highly suitable also for PLS SEM where we ask the same kind of question when it comes to our structural model and uh, the hypothesized relationships. For this reason, it's super interesting um, to learn today from Nicole and Sven um, what NCA is and how to bring it into uh, the PLS SEM context. Before we get started, um, we uh, switch to the next slide. I would like to introduce uh, Nicole and Sven really quickly. And uh, this is more like um, a Hamburg session, of course. So we have all uh, three of us have very strong links uh, to Hamburg. And to start with Nicole, um, Nicole, she studied um, business administration at the University of Hamburg with, amongst others, a major in operations management and uh, started as a PhD student at the Institute of Operations Management at the University of Hamburg. And that's um, where I got to know Nicole. Um, we were more or less sitting next door to each other um, when starting our university careers. Nicole received a PhD on the internationalization and firm performance from the University of Hamburg before she continued um, her academic career at Hamburg University of Technology. And uh, that's where she received her habilitation. That's in Germany, something like a second PhD, which you need uh, for the qualification as a full professor. And uh, she accomplished um, this uh, quite ambitious task, of uh, this is on a much more elabor elaborated level, on uh, the determinants of success in international business. The research focus today is on strategic and international management uh, with a special em emphasis on cross-cultural aspects. And Nicole's publications have appeared in renowned journals such as uh, the Journal of World Business, um, the Journal of International Management, International Business Review, International Journal of Human Resource Management, and Long Range Planning. Let's take a look at Sven. Sven um, uh, is now a professor of uh, human resource management and the head um, of uh, the chair of labor human resource management at Helmut Schmidt University. That's the University of the Federal Armed Forces uh, of Germany in Hamburg. And uh, he studied social, sociology, psychology, and economic uh, sciences at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. 
and uh, for his doctorate, uh, he came to Hamburg and joined uh, the University of Hamburg, where he um, uh, uh, yeah, got uh, his uh, further qualifications, uh, especially uh, the habilitation, again, the second uh, PhD to become uh, a full professor uh, in Germany. And his main research interests are in the inter interrelationships between the design of human resource management and its effects um, uh, on employees and organizational performance. Most recently, Sven has worked on HRM systems, um, job qualification, job satisfaction, as well as on the influence on national institutions and culture. His research has been published in leading international journals, uh, such as the Human Resource Management uh, Journal, um, Human Resource Management, International Journal of Human Resource Management, and Journal of International Management, as well as International Business Review. I will provide some links um, later in the chat so that you can directly inspect uh, Sven's and Nicole's uh, web pages so for further information on our presenters uh, today. But um, yeah, on behalf of the PLS 2022 conference, uh, to name Huen Wang, uh, Eat You, Marco Sarstedt, um, and myself, who are the uh, conference uh, co hosts. It is our pleasure um, to welcome you, and we are quite excited uh, to learn about NCA and uh, PLS SEM. And uh, this is definitely going to become an enjoyable and an informative afternoon. So that about expectation management. And now the floor is all yours. Welcome, and uh, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, I will start. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, even though I have to admit, um, it was a really long introduction. It was really nice to hear it all. Um, however, it cost us uh, five minutes, I would say. <laughs> we have a tough program, and uh, so we uh, have to go ahead. Um, but uh, fortunately, this session is recorded, so if I'm too quick, uh, you can uh, watch a video afterwards uh, in slow motion, like something like that. <laughs> okay, um, I'm starting. Um, with the first part, we kind of assume that you are familiar with uh, PLS and therefore our focus in this session is on uh, introducing you to necessary condition analysis, to necessity thinking. So the first part is uh, the emphasis on NCA. It is first part, it depends a little bit on how many questions we will receive is about 60 to 90 minutes, I would say. <laughs> um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat. Nicole and Wang Uli, who is also uh, familiar with NCA, we will address your questions either in the chat or will direct uh, these questions to me. Um, and we will make a, a break during the presentation um, and to answer your questions. So um, I am going to uh, show you um, why NCA might be relevant um, for your study or in general. Um, how you can conduct an NCA, and I will also give you an example um, to illustrate uh, what NCA does. And afterwards, uh, Nicole, in the second part, will show you how you can best combine your PLS SCM analysis with NCA. Uh, at the end, if you are still with us and uh, decide to apply NCA, we will also give you some information on support uh, where you can uh, find more information on NCA. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session where we'll, we, are, we'll, we will address all the questions that have not been answered uh, during um, our presentation. So I'm going to start. Um, why NCA? First of all, some uh, methodological publications. These, methodolog these publications are from Jan Duhl, who, uh, who we would call the father of NCA because Jan, uh, he invented uh, basically the methodology. Uh, the first paper appeared 2016 in Organizational Research Methods, and it's kind of the core paper or the initial uh, of necessary condition analysis. We have further paper on the statistical significance test that was uh, later on implemented. And Jan recently also published a book on conducting uh, necessary condition analysis, which is, which is kind of a very comprehensive source um, on how to conduct the necessary condition analysis. In the last years, we saw a rapid increase of uh, NCA-related publications. So if you consider that it's a really new uh, methodology, it was uh, established in 2016, at the end of 2016, but now we already have 80 publications using NCA. And uh, 
uh, you see here very different fields uh, of research. Um, however, if you look at uh, these different numbers uh, where the uh, publications appear, um, I think there's a huge potential and maybe you can also be a pioneer uh, of using NCA in uh, your field. NCA is uh, currently also recommended from key um, people in methodology. For example, uh, Herman Aguinis, who's, who's coming the uh, who's the upcoming president of the Academy of Management, we recently uh, suggested to use NCA to address research challenges in international um, business research. And we think this is really a good sign that NCA really is an interesting topic and maybe does something that other methodologies don't. So what is NCA? Um, basically, we could say that NCA is an analytical approach and a data analysis technique uh, to identify necessary conditions in data sets. The focus of NCA is on single conditions that are necessary or critical for the outcome. So um, applying NCA, you have statements in mind like you must have X to have Y, or you must have a certain level of X to have a certain level of Y. Yeah, or in other words, uh, if you assume that X is necessary for Y, you assume that you will not have a Y if there is no X. Yeah, and if Y is present, there will always be an X present. Yeah, necessary conditions are everywhere. So having an internet connection is necessary, but not sufficient for attending this webinar, right? Having a GMAT test score is necessary, but not sufficient for admission to a PhD program. Many uh, who applied for a PhD program worldwide might need to have uh, a high GMAT score. And an example for management, I will provide you some more examples in a minute. Senior management commitment is necessary, but not sufficient for successful organizational change. So in our everyday life, we use multiple words representing necessity, necessity logic, yeah? X is necessary for Y, but we also say X is needed for Y, X is critical for Y, X is crucial, essential, indispensable for Y, X is a prerequisite of Y, requirement, and we can go on, okay? You see the table. Um, sometimes we also um, state a necessity in terms of constraints. So X constrains Y, X limits Y, X blocks Y, X bounds Y, restricts Y, is a barrier for Y, is a bottleneck for Y. Yeah, in all these instances, we say that without X, there cannot be Y, yeah? Um, we find necessity thinking or necessity logic in many, many theories. And uh, also, if you ha have a look at uh, different journals, uh, maybe also in your field, you will find uh, many theoretical statements on necessity or theoretical statements that use necessity logic. Here are just some examples from the Academy of Management journal. So, for example, researchers state that emotion recognition may be a necessary but insufficient ability involved in the performance of transformational leadership behavior. Or social relationships are necessary but not sufficient for promoting high performance cross business, business unit collaboration. And a final example here, I will uh, further use this example uh, in a minute. Organizational commitment may be a necessary but insufficient condition for low absenteeism. We, I have more examples and I could go on. Um, I, I will not read these as examples, but I uh, will point you to a, a restatement here, Gary Gertz. He is one of the modern thinkers um, of necessity logic. He stated that for any research area, one can find important necessary conditions. And I believe personally he is right. And at the beginning we saw that um, multiple research areas started uh, to use NCA. And in multiple research areas, NCA is applied. And I'm sure if you have a look at the publications in your field, you will find uh, expressions like X is necessary for Y. So necessary conditions in practice, um, necessary conditions are of high practical value. And from my perspective, this is a very, very good reason to study necessary conditions. Why have necessary conditions a high practical value? Yeah, simply because if a necessary condition is not in place, there is guaranteed failure. 
Yeah, the absence of a necessary condition cannot be compensated by other conditions or other or other determinants. So, or however, we could say the presence, uh, or it's important to note that the presence of the necessary condition does not guarantee success, but it may increase the likelihood of success. Yeah, this um, high practical re relevance of necessity thinking is um, also reflected in various concepts. Here's uh, the Moskov method. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar. So what does the Moskov method in project management says? Uh, the Moskov method distinguished between the must have factors, the should have factors, the could have factors, and the would like to have factors. And which are the most important factors? The must have factors. And practitioners are usually looking for the must have factors. Not at all the other factors that can influence a desired outcome, but at the must have factors that are necessary for the outcome. Yeah, and that is the key uh, or the, the, the main focus of practitioners. <clears throat> NCA represents one of three causal paradigms. Yeah, we have uh, additive logic. This is uh, the logic we are most familiar with. Yeah, when we do research, we usually assume that single determinants are sufficient but not necessary for changing the outcome. Yeah, our theoretical statements are a similar form like, like it is presented here. X likely has an effect on Y on average. Yeah, when you look at the uh, hypothesis um, in uh, every research field, you will find or you already have used uh, a similar uh, hypothesis. You assume what X or uh, um, a determinant is able to increase a desired outcome. Yeah, this is uh, this additive logic is usually used in regression based methodologies and it's additive because each single determinant yeah, can compensate for each other. Yeah, try to imagine the formula for the regression analysis and you will see that uh, each of the um, single determinants within the regression uh, uh, analysis yeah, is able or uh, there is an additive logic in this uh, formula. So every single determinant can compensate for the other. There's a second logic, which is configurational logic, which is used in QCA. Uh, in QCA, we search for combinations of single determinants, which are called configurations, that are sufficient but not necessary for producing the outcome. Yeah, the basic principle here is equifinality, and the theoretical statement usually is configuration of different determinants produces Y. Yeah? And we have necessity logic, which is used in NCA. In uh, NCA or applying NCA, we assume that single determinants are necessary but not sufficient to allow the outcome. And the theoretical statement, statement here is where must be X to have Y. From our perspective, uh, each causal logic needs uh, to correct methodology. So for additive logic, as I said, we usually use regression based uh, methodology. For conf configurational uh, logic, we use QCA. And for necessity logic, we would suggest to apply NCA. However, in the past, we have often observed a misfit uh, when testing necessity, especially uh, when necessity uh, was analyzed with regression-based methodology. Um, I wouldn't say that it is a mistake or an error that occurred in past research. It was simply a fact that no uh, correct methodology was um, um, was, was available. So um, here's what usually happened. Yeah, um, In many, many theories, we see um, necessity statement either in the introduction, in the theory, or hypothesis section. Yeah, Here's an example from Hausknecht Academy of Management. Um, in the theoretical section, uh, Hausknecht uh, state that organizational commitment may be a necessary but not sufficient condition for low absenteeism. So in other words, the assumption is that uh, you will, um, uh, that you, if you want to have low absenteeism, you need to have organizational commitment, right? So that's the theoretical statement here. So, but what happens is the necessity statement somehow magically is reformulated as a traditional hypothesis with an unspecified positive association between cause and the outcome. Yeah, the example here is the hypothesis in Hausknecht et al. Uh, when organizational commitment is low, higher levels of absenteeism may occur. Um, this is a completely different theoretical statement yeah, than the previous one. The previous one was necessity logic. Now we have sufficiency logic. Organization commitment can contribute to higher levels of absenteeism. 
And the next step, um, we see uh, or we saw in the past a traditional association analysis. Uh, so how's connected way uh, applied a regression analysis and defining is that organizational commitment uh, indeed can reduce absenteeism. So organizational con commitment on average contributes uh, to lower absenteeism. However, at the end, uh, if the hypothesis was confirmed, so House Connect at all, we found uh, uh, a significant association in the discussion section. We said the findings show that high organizational commitment is necessary to avoid high levels of absenteeism. And I would say, no, it's not a correct logic because uh, the, the uh, uh, methodology that was applied cannot um, analyze for necessity. And therefore, this uh, conclusion at the end um, is not fully correct. So why NCA? Um, I would say because many phenomena include factors that are necessary conditions that can stop the outcome. So um, we have in many, many research fields, we have phenomena um, that might be necessary conditions. Second, I would say um, applying NCA, we can gain uh, new theoretical uh, insights, very interesting empirical insights. Uh, which help us to understand these phenomena and to help us better understand. Christian, he was mentioning it at the beginning. So um, combining NCA with uh, another methodology like PLS helps us to better understand the structural model, helps us to better understand the relationships within, within this, this model. And last but not least, as I said, NCA has a high practical relevance because we are focusing on the must-have factors. If you want to further uh, read something about the relevance of necessary conditions, uh, here's a um, suggestion for further reading. Uh, if you are in the field of human resource management, um, you might be also interested in this study. We have a very nice example using high performance work practices and the ability motivation opportunity model, which uh, yeah, basically includes necessity thinking and we are applying this to um, HRM. Okay. That was already my first part, and I suppose we already have some questions. <laughs> That's true. Uh, we have a few questions that were coming in in the chat, and maybe it's a good idea just to repeat one or two of the concepts that you just introduced to make that fully clear. Um, nonetheless, I mean, Sven will anyways introduce one more bigger example, so I guess the understanding will be deeper and deeper the more we progress. But there was one issue coming up on slide 10 where there was this overview of uh, words that are used to express necessity or necessary conditions. And these were um, differentiated between enablers and constraints. And there was this question mark, okay, what actually is the difference now between an enabler and a constraint? Why are there these two different categories? Um, what is this about? Yeah, this is kind of kind of the wording we are using. Yeah, so X is necessary for Y. We would say, okay, without... Um, it's kind of uh, just just where we tried uh, or where we had a look uh, at the different formulations we are sometimes implicitly are using uh, to express necessity yeah so uh, sometimes we say okay if you have x you will have y or you can have y yeah it's kind of enabler and the other formulation would ever would be if you don't have x you will not have y and uh, what is kind of the uh, basic uh, distinguish uh, or the, the basic difference here. Yeah? So in one sense, X can block the outcome, a desired outcome. And the other formulation is kind of more thinking about, okay, I need to have X to have uh, a Y. Yeah? And I think the, the usefulness of this table will become uh, much clearer when you start with your own projects. Because in, uh, with necessity logic, you do not have a lot of well-established theories that already talk about this logic. So very often when you go through the articles, you find a lot of arguments that are necessity-like arguments. And you see uh, very often that authors are using exactly these expressions to talk about necessity. And I think that can be useful later when you are in your own projects to identify, is there a necessity thinking in my field? What is it about? And for that purpose, I would say these expressions are quite useful. Uh, then there was another aspect. Well, maybe maybe just, yeah. just, just something to add. I think it, um, or um, when we have finished this session today, I hopefully um, you are uh, aware what we 
need to better distinguish between sufficiency and necessity logic. Yeah, Sufficiency logic where we assume that an X can increase Y on average and necessity logic where we assume that um, X can block Y. Yeah, And sometimes, or if you look at your theories, um, research, uh, researchers are usually not aware of these differences. And uh, all these expressions are sometimes used implicitly and it's not clear uh, if you have uh, sufficiency logic in mind, uh, additive logic or necessity logic. And therefore it's uh, important to also think about these expressions we are using. And from my personal perspective, we as researchers, we should be very careful with the words we are using. If you are making a theoretical statement, we should be sure that the theoretical statement really implies the, the, the correct relationship or the, the correct uh, formulation between cause and outcome. There was one more question. I'm not so sure if it has resolved already uh, in the meantime. Um, it is about when to use necessary condition analysis and um, maybe the slide number 15 could be something um, that could be of help and Sven, maybe you would like to repeat or give another um, idea on that to, to make this fully clear when we should use NCA. <laughs> when, when you should, uh, okay, I, I would say a lot more about when to use NCA. Um, at the moment, uh, my first uh, reaction would be when you have uh, a theoretical statement that implies necessity. If you have a problem uh, in mind, yeah, what you want to resolve, and uh, now you're thinking about a necessity, uh, a necessary relationship within uh, that could resolve your problem, I think when you should start uh, thinking about using NCA. So, yeah. The, the, the simple answer would be if you are uh, uh, if you have a relationship that is based on necessity, you should apply NCA. Yeah. I think these were the two key issues. Um, at least I don't see any more pressing issues in the chat, so feel free to go on. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, more pressing issues will come up <laughs> when we go more into detail. So conducting an NCA, so how can you uh, apply NCA? And uh, as I just said, uh, the first step in conducting NCA is to formulate a necess uh, the necessary condition hypothesis or uh, the, the um, necessary condition statement. Yeah, You need to explain why the absence of X guarantees the absence of Y and why the absence of X cannot be compensated by other factors. So yeah, that's the starting point from my perspective. You need, uh, if you're thinking about necessity and if you're thinking about uh, uh, using NCA, you need to start from theory. Yeah? And starting from theory implies um, thinking about these two issues yeah? and starting to think about the relationship between X and Y. Yeah? Usually uh, we have X and Y and we put a plus or a minus, uh, which indicates uh, that uh, on average we assume that uh, X is changing, uh, Y will increase or Y will decrease. Yeah? But with necessity thinking, we put an NC here which indicates uh, necessity. So we assume that X is necessary for Y. Uh, necessity thinking or necessity theory is very parsimonious. Yeah. Um, what I mean here is uh, that necessity thinking is a fundamentally bi bivariate uh, analysis. Only two variables are analyzed at a time, one X and one Y. And this is possible because a necessary condition always operates in isolation from the rest of the causal structure. Yeah, think about a car. Yeah, a car needs an engine, whether it's uh, powered by fuel or, or, or electricity, and the car needs wheels. Yeah, both are necessary conditions uh, that the car can drive, but both necessary conditions are independent from each other. So, and therefore, uh, and I think it is also a very nice feature of necessity theory and necessity thinking, but it is very parsimonious. However, it, this does not apply that you cannot uh, analyze uh, multiple necessary conditions. On the contrary, uh, in complex models like structure equation modeling, uh, each independent variable, each exogenous construct can be a necessary condition. Yeah. However, when more variables are potential necessary conditions, the analysis, the analysis for each condition is done separately. And uh, this is possible um, since the necessity of X1 on Y does not depend on the necessity of X2 on Y. Um, we have immediately um, uh, one issue that is very quickly resolved. There's a question whether we would need 
to run a necessary condition analysis three times, for example, if we have three different necessary conditions to be tested? If you have three necessary conditions, you just can use one command, uh, and this one command um, makes the, the, the analysis for, for all the three necessary conditions. However, the, the analysis by itself is a bivariate analysis. So you do not, uh, you, you have to skip this thinking of uh, like multiple regression analysis where you uh, include uh, many, many variables uh, in your analysis and also control variables. Uh, what is not um, necessary in NCA. Um, I will also show you when I have the example, um, we do not have the problem of um, omitted variable bias yeah, applying NCA, because as I said, the um, necessity of one uh, determinant is independent of other determinants. Um, basic types of ne uh, necessary conditions. I think this will also help to better explain the idea of necessity. Uh, we have basically, we can distinguish between dichotomous, discrete and continuous necessary conditions. Um, dichotomous is the easiest um, way to think about necessity. So we are thinking about a condition and an outcome and the absence and the presence of the condition and the outcome. You know, think about my original statement uh, about the internet connection. Uh, but you need to attend this webinar, this, uh, webinar. So you need to have an internet connection. The internet connection needs to be present. Only with the internet connection, you will be able to attend this uh, webinar. The internet connection is necessary, but not sufficient. So you will have cases here. Yeah, the dots represent cases. Yeah, or numbers, instances. Yeah, um, many many people we stay. Many people have an internet connection. Um, however, <laughs> having an internet connection uh, is not sufficient to attend this webinar. Yes, you might need to have uh, uh, information on the link uh, to this webinar. So um, having an internet connection is necessary, but not sufficient um, to attending this webinar. Yeah? If you don't have an internet connection, you will, have, uh, you will not be able to attend uh, this webinar. We can extend this idea. Uh, to a more discrete case, so low, medium, high levels. And with the discrete case, uh, we have more fine-grained uh, analysis or more fine-grained statements. And we can also uh, extend these uh, to continuous uh, necessary conditions where we have here a scatter plot and we see an empty area uh, in the upper left corner. And we see that X, uh, the condition, yeah, you need to have a certain level of X to have a certain level um, of Y. And that is basically what what NCA does. It search for it searches for empty spaces, yeah, independent of the data structure. In each of these instances in these tables here, yeah, you see an empty space, and this in, empty space indicates uh, necessity. Yeah, we have combinations of dichoto, dichotomous, discrete, continuous variables that are possible. Uh, we will not cover that. However, I will uh, have a closer look uh, at these uh, three different. Um, types of necessary conditions. So here's the dichotomous case. Uh, in the dichotomous case, uh, we formulate a necessary condition in kind. Yeah, necessary condition in kind. We just say that X is necessary for Y. We do not make any assumptions about the level of X or the level of Y. We just have a basic assumption about that X is necessary for Y. Yeah, what was our initial uh, example? Yeah, that the presence of X is necessary for the presence of Y. However, we can also play with absence and presence um, of X and Y. Yeah? For example, here, the absence of X is necessary for the presence of Y. So for example, uh, Christian, maybe he's hoping that uh, coronavirus uh, will not be present in October. So because the absence of coronavirus um, will give him the opportunity to make an on-site conference. Yeah? And so we have one example about the absence of X that could be necessary for the presence of Y. And other examples are just the presence of X is necessary for the presence of Y. The absence of X is necessary for the absence of Y. As I said, uh, we can extend the dichotomous case to a discrete necessary conditions um, with um, levels uh, or scores um, uh, where we have more than, 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 than two levels. So here we have uh, three levels and we can make more precise uh, statements and we call this uh, necessity statements in degree. So we can say that a level of X might be necessary for a certain level of Y. 
Yeah, an example here, a medium level, yeah, if we call this is low, medium, high, a medium level of X is necessary for a superior level of Y. So this is the highest level of Y is two, and you need to have at least a medium level of X to have a superior level of Y. Here's another example where you have a high level of X is necessary for a superior level um, of Y. Yeah, if you do not, uh, if you have a medium or a low level of X, you will not have a very high level uh, of Y. Yeah, and so on. I think the basics or the, the, the logic uh, should be clear um, now. And again, uh, we can extend uh, the discrete case uh, to continuous necessary conditions, um, which is uh, especially interesting also applying NCA when you um, have latent constructs. So you see, yeah, these, these charts reflect the same pattern what I was using uh, for the dichotomous case. So a high X is necessary for high Y, a low X is necessary for high Y, high X is necessary for low Y, and low X is necessary for low Y. And interesting, uh, with continuous necessity statements, there are further options, uh, in partic particular nonlinear relationships. So you could think about necessity in terms of a concave or convex uh, relationship. Um, you could also think about something like that, yeah, where medium level of X might be necessary um, for a high level of Y yeah, in these uh, two instances. Or also theoretically possible, uh, a low or a high level of X might be necessary uh, to achieve a high Y. As I said earlier, NCA looks for empty spaces. And uh, this is done with the so-called ceiling line. The ceiling line is the key, fee, the key function in NCA. Yeah, the, you're, you're all familiar with the regression line, with, which is the key function in regression analysis and uh, what regression line is for OLS and other methodology or related methodologies. Uh, the ceiling line is the key function uh, in, in NCA. The ceiling line separates the space without observation from the space with observations, and it determines the level of the condition X that is necessary to reach a certain level of the outcome Y. Uh, in the software, we are multiple ceiling lines implemented currently. Um, two default ceiling lines are the CEFDH, which stands for Ceiling Envelopment Free Disposal Hall, which is basically a step function. And uh, this step function is recommended for discrete data or when the pattern of the observations are near the, bo near the border are, um, is ir irregular. And we have the CRFDH, the ceiling regression free disposal hall, which kind of smooths uh, the step function uh, using an OLS or regression line through the corners of the step function. And this is recommended for um, your continuous data or when the pattern of observations are near the borders, approximately linear. So I think what helps to understand is, so you see a scatter plot yeah, uh, from a fictive uh, data set, you have X and you have Y. And the, the, the blue dots are observations, and the ceiling envelopment line yeah, uses uh, the upper left um, or the extreme cases in the upper left corner yeah, and um, distinguish the uh, empty space uh, from the space with observations. Yeah? And the ceiling regression line is an OLS line through the uh, ceiling envelopment line. Yeah? Um, this, this chart also nicely highlights the difference again between NCA and OLS or regression analysis. The green line is the line through the middle of the data. It shows the average trend yeah, um, when we see or when we analyze uh, the relationship between X and Y. So we see there's almost no relationship, slight increase. Yeah? However, we see um, what here's a huge constraint. You need to have a high X to achieve a high Y. So. Yeah, based on regression analysis, we would say, yeah, there's only a slight increase uh, of Y when you increase X. However, from necessity logic, we would say, no, you need to have a high level of X to have a high level of Y. Um, another feature of NCA is the so-called bottleneck table. The bottleneck table is uh, nothing uh, different or represents the tabular, uh, uh, is a tabular representation of the ceiling line. Yeah, uh, the first column is usually the outcome, the next columns are the conditions. 
So if you have multiple conditions, uh, you, you have a table uh, with one uh, column on the left, which is your outcome, and the next columns are your conditions. And that is uh, especially useful if, if you have uh, multiple uh, necessary conditions, back, because you can uh, look for a certain level of the outcome, which are the necessary conditions uh, what you need uh, to achieve uh, a, a given value of the outcome. Yeah, the bottleneck table can always be read as for given value of the outcome. What are the necessary levels, minimum the required uh, minimum required levels uh, of the conditions? You can uh, use percentage, uh, actual values, or percentiles. Um, here's an example for our fictive data. Yeah, so you see um, here I used the percentage, ra uh, percentage range and the actual value. And we see that for a uh, rather low level of y, x is not necessary. Yeah, we do not need half or x is on the lowest level. However, if we further in, uh, go up uh, on y, we see that certain levels of x are necessary. And quickly, you need to have very high levels of x to achieve high levels of y. OK? Um, yeah, key parameters of NCA. Every methodology has uh, specific parameters. And in NCA, we use the effect size and accuracy. Um, the focus is uh, on the effect size. The effect size indicates the extent to which y uh, is constrained by x. Yeah, The higher d, the more uh, y is constrained by x. And the effect size is simply calculated by dividing the ceiling zone, which is the empty zone in the upper left corner here, um, by the total zone, the scope. Yeah, And so by definition, the D, D ranges between 0 and 1. We have also the accuracy, uh, which gives us the percentage of observations on or below the ceiling line. Um, by definition, for the ceiling envelopment line, which uses the upper left um, points here, uh, the accuracy is always 100%. Yeah? For the ceiling regression line, um, where are potential cases above the ceiling line, so the accuracy is lower than 100%. Yeah? And you also see that D depends on the ceiling line that you're using. Yeah? With ceiling envelopment, ceiling envelopment makes the empty space largest. Yeah? The empty space with the ceiling envelopment is larger than for the ceiling regression. Yeah, because it uses uh, the step function. And therefore, the effect size for the ceiling envelopment will always be larger than for the ceiling regression line. So how can you interpret uh, these effect sizes? Um, in already in his initial paper in 2016, Jan uh, proposed some arbitrary benchmarks. But these, uh, as always, if you propose benchmarks, uh, research uh, researchers will use them. And so these benchmarks are currently established. Um, so um, a D uh, lower than 0.1 uh, is called small effect. Uh, between 0.1 and 0.3 is medium effect. Between 0.3 and 0.5 is large effect. And beyond uh, 0.5 is a very large effect, what you see here. Uh, these categories were built on using many, many um, yeah, um, studies or, or samples and are built on how, um, how likely it is to find a really um, large effect. Um, currently, uh, we recommend to use an effect size of D larger than 0 0.1 as a threshold for a practical significance. Uh, in the past, many researchers have used this threshold uh, in order to accept their necessity hypothesis. However, um, beyond this practical significance, uh, you should always analyze the uh, um, statistical significance because your uh, estimated effect size might be due to uh, or might be a result of randomness and um, therefore um, a statistical significance test was also implemented in NCA. And this um, statistical significant te significance test gives you a p-value. And if the p-value uh, is small enough, you can conclude um, that your observed effect size is not due to randomness. Yeah? Um, so at the end, how should you decide about the support of a necessary condition? We would say, um, yeah, we are free necessary, but not sufficient conditions uh, for deciding uh, that an empty space indeed represents a necessary condition. 
Uh, first, you need to have theoretic support. Yeah, um, you always need to think why x is really indeed a necessary. Uh, why x is a, is a necessary condition for y? Why x cannot be compensated by other uh, factors? And um, more from a statistical perspective, you need to have practical significance. You would say d should at least be uh, 0 0.1, and uh, you should need to decide about the statistical significance. Yeah, for example, we usually apply the uh, significance level of um, five percent, uh, where we say, okay, this is statistically significant. So limitations, maybe, or maybe Nicole, please. A, yeah, maybe here's a good uh, point to jump in because there are a few questions coming in. And I think one of the questions is worth consideration here in the bigger uh, audience. Mm. Um, one of the participants is struggling with the question whether a moderating effect is not the same thing uh, than analyzing a necessary condition. And I can so much follow this argument because I was in the same thinking for, I would say, two or three weeks. And I had yep. a few discussions with Ben on that. And I was always convinced that it's, it's not true what he's telling me. <laughs> he tried to, to look at the formula. Um, I have already provided um, a text um, in the chat from, from a working paper on the misunderstandings on NCA that could be helpful, but maybe Sven, you can give it a try. Um, I know that <laughs> you have given it a try with me a lot of times, and at some point it worked, uh, so uh, that could be helpful maybe. Okay, I will go back here, um, because I, uh, hopefully, uh, which is the best way to explain it. Um, so what do we, what do, you, do we see here? It's the regression uh, line, and what does moderation do? The moderation decides this, if this or uh, looks for um, the question be, be behind moderation is uh, whether the effect on of x on y uh, is dependent on another variable. So, but what does moderation does? It only shifts this regression line or, or changes uh, the slope of the regression line. Yeah, but uh, moderation does not give you uh, insights about the ceiling. Yeah, moderation only looks if the slope yeah, of this relationship between x and y is dependent on another variable. And that is not, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, necessary condition analysis. Yeah, uh, We only look if the average effect from x on y depends on another variable. Yeah, But uh, here we analyze not the relationship between x and y and a third variable, we want to know if x is indeed necessary for y. So we do not consider a third variable. On the contrary, as I said earlier, yeah, we have um, one x and one y and we are focused on this kind of relationship. Okay. Sven, I remember that you have, um, I think one in one of your papers, you have even addressed that in a small paragraph. I'm not sure which paper it was, but I remember that there was even the formula given and some a more analytical um, assessment of this difference between NCA and moderation. Um, wasn't that in one of the publications that I could maybe recommend as a reading? Uh, but, but the, the earlier publications, uh, what I um, recommended for further reading about the uh, um, relevance of NCA, uh, where we have addressed this. Uh, uh, this paper was um, published online, I think, two years ago. And two years ago, uh, we had to struggle with reviews because from reviews, we got the same questions. Yeah, yeah, but it's just moderation. And we said, no, it's not moderation. And therefore, we, we addressed this issue in this paper also and so please have a look at this paper again what i uh, was mentioning earlier uh we addressed this um uh, where someone is drawing on my presentation <laughs> okay nicole do we have further questions or... i think that's that's what was relevant yeah, yeah but it, it's it's really an important question it's important also to understand um necessity thinking or how how necessity uh, necessary condition analysis is uh, is working I mean, there's another one coming in um, in terms of when we have to use NCA. So is there a situation when we have to use it? So it's still a little bit unclear when actually we will go for a necessary condition analysis. <laughs> um, still talking about fit. Yeah, um, we had uh, this, this table at the beginning. Um, I think you, from a theoretical perspective, yeah, start start from your theory yeah if you think that a certain condition can block uh, your outcome yeah if you think that a certain condition if it is absent yeah and the absence lead to guaranteed failure 
you need to start thinking about uh, necessary condition analysis. Yeah? If you want to, um, I think also in the second part, Nicole, she will also, when, when we combine PLS uh, and NCA, we will see a little bit the difference. Yeah? Um, usually we assume what X has uh, X is able to increase an outcome. Yeah, we usually think, how can we increase a desired outcome? Yeah, and we look for things that can increase an outcome we want to have. But that is not the thinking uh, of necessity. Necessity thinking is, what do I need to have to make the outcome real? Yeah, it's about the absence of the outcome. And that is, uh, yeah. It is really important to understand this difference. Yeah, and uh, if you think, if you're thinking about the ladder, if you're thinking about which conditions need to be there, yeah, um, to have a certain level of the outcome or to have even an outcome, you need to start thinking about using NCA. But it was the kind of fit um, I was talking at the beginning. Okay. I see in the chat, we, we, I also have a practical example and maybe this also helps to understand um, these issues, okay? Okay, um, let's continue our limitations of NCI. Um, I think it is important to say that NCI uses um, observational data and like any other analysis technique cannot guarantee causality. Yeah, so the requirements for causal interference are the same as for any other type of cause effect relationships. Yeah, the cause should precede the outcome, the cause is related to outcome and uh, no other variables responsible for the observed relationship. You in the bandy. <laughs> yes. Uh, very important. Um, so uh, from risk perspective, it is, again, it is very important that the identified necessary conditions are theoretically justified. I again see some, some drawings on my presentation. I'm, I'm sure if everyone else is seeing these drawings, no? Yes, you are all, I, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So yes, someone else I, is. Uh, someone else is doing that. Um, <laughs> maybe yeah, if it's someone, not too much. Uh, <laughs> okay. Can you someone remove? <laughs> I think there's the option to clean and uh, all the drawings. Yeah, yes. Totally. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. Again, causality. I think an important issue and. A second issue uh, I think it is important to talk about uh, is that NCA may be more susceptible for sampling and measurement error. Um, it is very important using M NCA to carefully consider the empirical design and to check the data prior to its analysis, um, so to check for outliers. So as I said, I think this is an important issue, so al please allow me some um, more basic insights on this. So why is this the case? Yeah, Why is NCA sensitive to outliers? Yeah, simply because only a few cases in the empty space determine the ceiling line. Yeah, let me go back to, to such a scatter plot here. So yeah, he would say we have strong necessary condition. Yeah, X is indeed uh, constraining Y. So if I, but if I put one observation only here, yeah, the whole analysis uh, would look different between because the ceiling line yeah would look something like that yeah it would go up immediately and maybe go here yeah and so um, only one or few cases in the empty space uh, yeah are responsible for this uh, ceiling line so um, but the question is are a few cases enough to reject the hypothesis and here we have two different views. In a deterministic view, we would say, okay, yeah, every single case can falsify a necessity theory. So this implies that the necessity applies to practically each single case in the domain. Yeah, you assume that uh, I don't know, an engine and wheels are necessary conditions where the car can drive, but you find a car that does not have any wheels, and so our hypothesis is rejected. So someone cons uh, constructed a car without wheels and it still can drive. So necessity theory or necessity hypothesis is rejected. However, we could also take a probabilistic view. Yeah, A few cases can show up, uh, or in this probabilistic view, a few cases can show up above the ceiling line such uh, that the empty space is not fully empty. So um, using this probabilistic view, yeah, um, 
necessity statements are more flexible in terms of like practically, virtually, or almost um, always necessary. Yeah, where is no general rule. Yeah, what are few cases? It is one. Is it one percent of all your observations? Is it, is it five percent? Yeah, these are just arbitrary choices. Yeah, we do not have a, a general rule on that. So, but you could think about it and. Um, to illustrate it, I have a, an example here. Um, so this is uh, data from students who applied for admission to a sociology graduate program in the US. Um, the students uh, quantitative graduate record examination score, this GRE score, yeah, uh, students needed to have uh, a score of at least 620 to be administered to the program. Yeah, so this is a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition. You see, even though um, multiple students had a score of 620, not all of them got into the program. I don't so, know. Yeah, only okay. uh, 34 got into the program and many did not. Yeah, so students usually uh, have to apply, make a, a, a letter, a motivation letter. Yeah, and uh, there are multiple information. So the GRE score, yeah, is not the only. Um, condition to be administered uh, to the program. So here we see one case. Yeah, uh, If you remember my, uh, my first uh, presentation with the dots, yeah, we said, OK, the presence of x is necessary for the presence of y. And here we need to have an empty space. So now we don't have an empty space here. Yeah? And the question is, um, yeah, still do we reject our necessity uh, hypothesis? that the GRE score is a necessary determinant for uh, the admission, or do we have a more probabilistic view? Yeah? In a deterministic view, we would say, no, there's no necessity. Yeah? Because we have one student who got admitted to the program, even uh, if he or she had a lower GRE score. Yeah? But from this case, yeah, um, we know that this person here was admitted based on a faculty member's explicit testimony. Yeah, so this person knew someone in the program and was administered to the program, uh, even with a lower GRE score. So, in a more probably probabilistic view, we would say, you know, um, almost always uh, you need to have a high GRE score of at least six hundred and twenty. Yeah, this is the probabilistic view, and I hope hopefully this example shows you the difference yeah, when when we should think about deterministic or probabilistic view. Importantly, uh, you need to do an outlier analysis uh, when you apply NCA. Usually, it is recommended uh, prior to every analysis. Yeah, but uh, from my experience, many researchers don't uh, do it. Um, so. Um, here's just a path diagram how you should do it. And of course, if you have an outlier due to sampling or measurement error, we would say, um, yeah, just get, get rid of the case. Yeah. But if you cannot establish any sampling or measurement error, I would always say um, keep the case and look uh, at the specific characteristics of the case. What makes the case so important and so interesting? Uh, from my perspective, outliers can help you to build theory, refine your theory. Yeah, these cases are important no? to uh, um, uh, establish or, or extend your theory. So um, be very careful how to deal with outliers. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's kind of conducting NCA. Um, before I uh, go to my example, Nicole. For the questions, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, there is. Um, there are a few questions. Some of them we can deal with in the chat. Um, one of the participants has a very specific question where I'm not fully sure whether I get uh, the meaning of it. It's Felix. Uh, Felix, if you feel uh, confident uh, to come in, I think that would be the easiest. Thank you very much. My question is. Uh... In the previous slide, we were having uh, both uh, uh, the, the matrix, uh, that is the quadrant. It was very similar to the confusion matrix where we have uh, the recall and uh, uh, that is the sensitivity and the predict, uh, sensitive, sensitivity and uh, the other uh, metrics like F1 score accuracy for uh, determining the 
uh, whether the hypothesis is true or not. So can we use the same type of uh, uh, true positives and true negatives uh, to identify the accuracy, whether if we have a, a, a case where we uh, there is uh, no, uh, there is some uh, observations in the uh, in the uh, in the in the space that is the uh, no, no space. I hope uh, I'm clear. Um, yeah, I, I think I think I got it. You, you're referring. Uh, can we use accuracy, yeah, to establish or to make a, some assumption about the de deterministic or the probabilistic view? Um, I would say. No. So from my first reaction would be, um, yeah, I'm going back again to the scatterplot because for me, the scatterplot always helps um, to establish um, um, kind of the this necessity thinking. So if you have an outlier here, yeah, let's assume uh, the scatterplot remains the same, but we, we have one more case uh, with two uh, of x2 and y8. Yeah. So uh, we, we would have one one observation here yeah and the ceiling line would be completely different yeah because the ceiling line would go up here yeah go all the way up and here yeah so um and the effect size would dramatically decrease yeah because the empty space is very low uh with an observation here yeah however the other uh, observations remain the same the, the accuracy for the ceiling envelopment would still be 100 percent yeah um, however, also the ceiling regression line would look very different because it, because it uses uh, the extreme cases of the ceiling envelopment line. And therefore, maybe only this one case shows up uh, above the ceiling line. So the accuracy would still be maybe the same or similar like that. So whether it not, whether it's not, so accuracy is not a good uh, measure to decide about um, the the deterministic or the probabilistic view. Yeah, um, my suggestion would be have a close look um, uh, at your data, have a close look at the distribution of your data. Um, maybe do do different analysis. Um, do an analysis um, with the outlier and without the outlier, and compare the results. Yeah, and therefore try to learn what is happening with your data. Um, Maybe this single case might be very interesting because the single case is able to reach a very high level of the, of the outcome with a minimum of input. Yeah? And therefore, it might be a best case in, 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 in your whole study. So it's really important to analyze these, these exceptional cases. Yeah? OK, I hope this, this helps a bit. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is um, another question on the practical relevance of NCA. So there are some participants wondering whether NCA actually has relevance for business practice projects. Um, I would like to comment on that directly maybe here uh, because I have been using NCA for many business practice projects. We are doing a lot of consulting on web shop satisfaction where we are looking at what are really the drivers of um, online shop satisfaction in these shops. What do the designers need to think about to make the shop convincing? And in these projects, we very often have also used necessary condition analysis to identify what are the minimum necessary levels for some of these features that need to be there to ensure that there will be an online shop satisfaction at the end of the day. These things concern, for example, aspects such as uh, security of your data. Um, these um, results often indicate um, payment methods as relevant necessary conditions to some extent. So I would say definitely um, from my experience in business practice projects, it's very useful. Ben has introduced the Moscow uh, method uh, earlier. So um, I think especially for business practice uh, projects, it's quite a, a nice tool that can be used. So um, practical relevance, definitely. Uh, j just, just to add a, a personal thought on that. Um, have you looked at how social science have established or, or have developed in the last years? From my perspective, uh, we are we are we are um, trying to have more and more complex models. So model complexity have increased rat rapidly in the, in the in the last years. So um, because we uh, are more familiar with all the factors that are influencing a desired outcome. So um, our models include I don't know ten uh, independent variables, twenty. And a lot of control variables. So model complexity is increasing, increasing um, over the last uh, decades. 
Um, so, however, you have many variables in these complex models and every variable can explain a slight increase in the outcome. So if you're honest, uh, at the end, you have explained variance of 20%, 30%, which is in my field, human resource management, yeah, because um, for example, well-being or organizational performance are influenced by many, many other factors apart from human resource management. So the explained variance is not very high. However, we use multiple independent variables, I have very complex models. And um, if you go with such models to practitioners, you say, yeah, I have identified 20 factors that are uh, important to increase your outcome. Um, I think many practitioners will say, yeah, but I cannot influence all 20 factors at the same time. Give me the most important. What are the most important factors that I have success? And for my thinking or from my perspective, necessity thinking or necessity theory uh, using NCA can help you to identify uh, with most important factors. And therefore, I think um, necessary condition analysis is of very high practical value because we can identify the must have factors. There are a few questions coming in, but I think that these might resolve when we get to the part of combining the two methods. So in light of the time, I would propose that maybe yes. Ben continues with the example. And okay. then um, we can see if, if the questions resolve and, and bring them in, in case not. Okay. I think also the example we can do quickly. Um, so it's uh, an example. Basically, we, we were asking uh, if certain personality traits are necessary for sales performance. Yeah, we have sales people, and the question is, what makes a good salesperson? Yeah, and uh, we can look at personality traits that, are, that can either increase sales performance, um, or we could say, uh, do sales people need to have certain personality traits to have a high level of sales performance? But this um, study, which will coming. Uh, which is uh, forthcoming uh, in the handbook of research methods for marketing management, where Christian is also uh, an editor. So maybe, hopefully, Christian, someone is here. I don't know. Um, so um, what are our variables? Um, we have sales performance, um, which is kind of sales ability of salespeople. And we have four different personality traits. We have ambition, sociability, interpersonal sensitivity, and uh, learning approach. Um, I think we don't need to go into detail. So we have four different personality traits and um, we can assume or hypothesize that these personality traits are necessary conditions for uh, sales performance. We use data from the Hogan personality inventory. Also no need to go into detail here. Um, here are descriptive statistics. Um, so here we already see that ambition and sociability uh, might be uh, personality traits that are somehow related um, to sales ability or sales performance. And before I go uh, or before I present you the um, results from a necessary condition analysis, um, traditional thinking, yeah, um, OLS regression thinking. Um, when we use this thinking, we usually interpret um, or using uh, OLS, um, we have usually use sufficiency logic. Yeah, we assume that X is able to produce Y, but X is sufficient, uh, but necess not necessary for Y. We imply that each of these um, personality traits um, is able to increase sales ability. Yeah, but using um, sufficiency logic, we would not say that you need to have one of these um, aspects because, yeah, here's the regression and uh, uh, formula for regression analysis. Yeah. If you do not have ambition, yeah, you can compensate uh, the missing ambition through a high level of sociability or a high level of interpersonal sensitivity or learning approach. Yeah? And so for the rest of these um, other um, personality traits. So that is our usual thinking. Yeah? You can increase sales ability by a higher level of ambition on average. Yeah? That is uh, all I was thinking. So if you do a multiple regression analysis with this uh, data, uh, we see. Uh, only sociability. Yeah, we, we have hypothesized that four, all four of these personality traits uh, can increase sales ability. Um, but we see from our regression analysis, uh, only sociability has a significant effect. Okay, we, do, we could decide about the p-value, maybe 10%, it's a small data set. 
But uh, let's skip to the idea that, OK, we are rigorous and we say, no, our results need to be uh, uh, significant on the 5% level. So only sociability, for, only for sociability, we find a significant effect. What would be our conclusion? How would we go to practitioners? How would we interpret these findings? In our discussion, we would say, even though we hypothesized a relationship between all four personality traits, we only found uh, that sociability has a significant effect. And our, in our implication section, we would say, please, um, HR managers, whoever, you have to focus on sociability, right? That would be the implication from the study. And our implication would be a higher level of sociability can increase uh, sales performance. Um, all the other, for all the other factors, we do not see uh, a significant relationship on average. So we would assume these are not important. Uh, causal theory or applying necessity thinking is different. So uh, here we would uh, again make our hypothesis, but we would not make a plus. Uh, assuming that uh, all these personality traits are able to increase sociability, but we would say all these personality traits are necessary conditions for sociability, which, which would imply that we need to have a certain level of these personality traits to have a certain level of sociability. Here are the results, uh, the bottleneck tables and the scatter plots, and you immediately see that for low levels of sales performance, yeah, which goes from zero to 5.5 here, yeah, um, all these personality traits are not necessary. Yeah? For example, for level of two, uh, you need, do not need to have a certain level of ambition um, and so on. Each of these personality traits is not necessary for a sales performance of two. However, we see that for level of three, you need to have at least a low level of ambition. And can continue is uh, for a level of four. Yeah, um, we need to have at least a certain level uh, of each of these um, personality traits. And for a very high level uh, of sales performance, which is the highest observed level here in this data set, we see that ambition should be um, rather high. We need, we need a medium level of interpersonal sensitivity, a rather high um, learning approach, and a very high level of sociability to have the highest level of um, sales performance. We can also use this, maybe it was, uh, also makes it more illustrative uh, when we pick one case yeah, in our data set. So uh, we have um, one specific um, person and this uh, specific person uh, in red, you see uh, the actual uh, sales performance and the actual values on this uh, personality inventory. So um, we will see, okay, the sales performance is four. And uh, which is possible uh, since this person uh, always has higher levels of these personality traits when it is required. Yeah. So for ambition, for example, uh, you need to have a level of 30, uh, 33 to have sales performance of four. And this specific person has a level of 65. So it's okay, yeah? And all the others are also okay. So maybe you're an HR manager and you want to increase the performance of this um, salesperson. You'd say, okay, I want to have a sales performance of five. So where do I need to start, yeah? And here we see, um, okay, ambition, it's okay, yeah? We do not need to invest in, uh, in ambition. Likewise, interpersonal sensitivity, yeah, it's also okay, learning approach, okay. Uh, but we see, um, here's the bottleneck, yeah? This person does not have enough sociability and therefore this person cannot have a high level or a level of five on sales performance, yeah? And so we can identify the bottleneck um, and we can say, you yeah, need to invest in the sociability of this person. Investments in all these other personality characteristics, yeah? Investments in ambition, for example, does not serve anything. It's useless because you need to get rid of the bottleneck, the bottleneck first. You need to start here because here's the bottleneck. You need to invest in sociability. Investments in all the other personality ca characteristics does not serve anything. You need to get rid of the um, bottleneck. As I said, um, what's with omitted, omitted variable bias, I think is an important issue also um, because we talked about the model complexity and uh, parsimonious uh, theory when you apply necessity thinking. 
So here you see the D values uh, for our for personality traits. You uh, again see the coefficients from regression analysis. So what happens if I exclude one of the variables from my analysis? If I exclude sociability, I do not integrate sociability in my analysis. Yeah, the model for regression is different because we did not integrate a important uh, personality characteristics. Yeah, so we see, for example, if I go back and forth, you see ambition. Uh, the value uh, for ambition increases, yeah, because we do not control for sociability, and ambition and sociability are, might be related. Yeah, all the um, other values are also changing, but what does not change? The values from necessary condition analysis, because it is a bivariate analysis. Yeah, excluding or including sociability is. Uh, doesn't change anything uh, for our results. The values are always the same, uh, independent uh, whether I uh, control for sociability or include sociability in my analysis or not. Okay, does that make sense? <laughs> make sense? <laughs> okay, um, last slides for the for the um, first part. Uh, strengths of NCA. Uh, if you're thinking about NCA. Um, I think one strength is the newness um, of the methodology. Yeah, um, editors, um, journals, we like new things, right? <laughs> and if you come come up uh, with a new methodology, um, new thinking, uh, you might have an advantage. And initially, I said, yeah, be the pioneer in your field, right? <laughs> and um, it could be uh, uh, using NCA uh, could be a good way um, to get a, a good publication. Um, necessity logic, it's a different logic uh, than a logic we are used to, yeah, and I think it is also strength. Parsimonious theory, yeah, we do not need to think about all the, the possible variables that need to be included in the data. It also makes uh, data collection more simple. We do not need uh, all the control variables. We do not need very complex models. The data analysis is straightforward. Um, it's broadly applicable. Yeah, in any research field, we will have necessary conditions It's of high practical relevant. I hope this point uh, got clear and it gives opportunity for very interesting publications from my perspective. Yeah. What are the weaknesses, the newness? <laughs> I just said it's a strength, but it's also it's also its weakness. Yeah, we, we know how journals are working and how reviewers are working. So uh, new things will always create skepticism. Yeah, we see a, or we saw a rapid increase of NCA related publications. Um, however, it's not a methodology that is really established in the field. Yeah, and so you might get resistance uh, from reviewers, um, from um, editors who say, no, it's too new. I'm not sure if it's good or not. So that is kind of a weakness of NCA. It's also non-dominant logic. You have to start thinking about necessity, yeah. Um, and so, also reviewers who are not familiar with this kind of logic um, might be hesitant to accept your paper. The theory is not about the presence um, of the outcome, yeah. We say which level of x do we need, but we do not say how can we increase the outcome, yeah. But we are used to this logic. How can we increase a desired outcome? NCA does not do that. And therefore, combining NCA with other methodologies like PLS is very attractive from my perspective. Yeah. Another weakness, uh, the sensitivity to outliers. Therefore, I uh, got into this a uh, little bit more. Yeah. So you have to think about you know, and carefully uh, analyze uh, if you have outliers and if yes, how to deal with it. We have some unresolved technical issues. Um, so what is the best ceiling line? Uh, we're still playing a little bit. Also the inferential statistics are not fully developed. Um, we're trying to establish confidence on towards, uh, for example, uh, but this is not uh, currently at the moment, it's not implemented. Okay, so far um, for our first part, uh, maybe time for some questions, Nicole? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, Sven, there are, of course, a lot of participants who are well trained in the PLS world and uh, who yes. already go through all the evaluation criteria <laughs> that they have in mind for the typical structural modeling approach. And I think one of the questions um, goes around this topic of omitted variable bias and also multicollinearity. So again, the question, how are my results impacted by 
the relationships that might be there between the independent constructs. Uh, maybe you can repeat that one more time to, to ensure that this is understood because I will also need that. Yeah, you need it. Um, and, and my answer would be, um, think about omitted variable bias um, when you think about applying PLS or structural equation modeling in general or, or regression analysis. Where's the issue? Uh, and and um, where you need to be very careful. Um, in applying NCA, we have the advantage that we do not need to consider control variables. Yeah, We do not need to integrate them into our analysis. Yeah, And therefore, um, when you combine different methodologies, um, when it becomes tricky and uh, when it becomes an issue. Yeah. So um, that would be an issue. And then there's another question that circles around reliability and validity um, of the results and reliability and validity in the context of NCA. Maybe that is something that we should. Yeah, I think it's uh, like always, um, it, it starts with your data. Yeah, um, so NCA, cannot guarantee you uh, validity, reliability, um, because it depends uh, how good is your data? How much effort uh, did you put in, in gathering this data? Yeah, and um, so NCA just uses, it's just a tool that uses your data and tries to analyze it. And you should think about um, your measures before you start um, gathering the data. Yeah, and um, but again, and maybe Nicola, you're, you're also covering this a bit. Again, combining PLS and NCA gives you an advantage because uh, using PLS, you have a lot of approach how to test uh, validity, reliability, how to test the quality of your data. Yeah, and um, if you start with PLS and then afterwards use NCA as an additional or complementing methodology you already established using PLS uh, that you have good measures, yeah? but you can be confident uh, with, with the measures you're using. So you're not a freed up from, from testing for reliability of the measurements or from the validity of your sample. That is something that you would need to do anyways for your research project, but this is not specific to NCA. So NCA itself does not have a set of specific guidelines or, or um, evaluation criteria that you need to go through for the necessary condition analysis. So if we look at the combination of PLSM and NCA in a minute, um, you have the wonderful situation that you can use all the criteria that you are familiar with in your PLS world, um, check all of these things. So in terms of the, for example, reliability of the measurements and then perform the NCA on scores that you generate from PLS. Checking if we are missing some questions. Oh, I think that is the most, I hope I have not missed one. Sven, maybe you need to go through when we switch roles. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, I would suggest if you do not have any immediate question right at the moment, um, Nicole and I, we're just switching our presentation. So Nicole can, uh, she's going to present the second part. Um, so I, I stopped sharing my screen. Nicole is um, starting the presentation from her side so she can easily uh, flip uh, through her um, slides. And uh, yeah, we're changing your roles. I'm going to uh, moderate uh, a little bit and uh, have a look at the chat. And I would suggest while we are changing, maybe we have five minutes break or yeah, make a short break really just to switch the slides, uh, get something to drink, have a, a short break. And um, in four minutes, we are starting again. Fantastic. I hope everybody is back after a very short bio break. Um, and Sven has done a very nice introduction on necessity logic and the idea of necessary condition analysis. And in the second part of the presentation, we would like to focus on the combination of partially square structural equation modeling and necessary condition analysis. When we started this whole necessary condition analysis adventure, I would say a couple of years ago with uh, Jan Dull um, becoming ambassadors for NCA, we were very enthusiastic about it. And at some point um, I started doing some videos on the YouTube channel, uh, publishing that. And then um, also in the channel, there are a lot of PLS related videos and links. 
And uh, there were a lot of questions on, can we use NCA with PLSM? Where's the difference? So many of the questions that we have seen earlier today were coming into um, comments um, to, my, to my videos or posted um, to my email. And then at some point we decided, let's make a nice project and see how can we actually combine PLSM and necessary condition analysis it's not something that is um, of super difficulty, but of course, if no one has done it before, there's a lot of unsecurity um, around this whole process. So we decided in a nice team uh, together with Sandra, Christian and Marco and Sven uh, to come up with an article where we try to give guidelines on how we could combine PLSM with necessary condition analysis. Please note, as Sven has already indicated, we are still in the process with some of the developments. Jan is playing around with different ceiling lines so there might be uh, new developments around this new method, but this is kind of the first set of experiences that we wanted to share as a guideline. Yeah, in terms of uh, factor scores or composite concepts, latent concepts that you are used to using in partially square structural equation modeling, yes, these can also be used in necessary condition analysis. The analysis itself doesn't care actually which kind of measurements you introduce to the method. So it's working with everything. Um, and it's your job to ensure that the measurements that you integrate to necessary condition analysis are useful, are reliable, are making sense um, for your research projects. So you can use factor scores and you can also use composite scores that are generated in partially square structural equation models. When we uh, discussed the question which scores actually to use, um, we also discussed a little bit in team, we came to the conclusion, yes, if we are going for a structural equation model, and we are interested in certain relationships that are kind of, of represented in the model, we would recommend using the composite scores of PLSM because they actually represent the underlying theory, the conceptual thinking that is there on the structural relationship between the different constructs that we're using. To make this part a little bit uh, more practical, we decided to um, yeah, refer everything to an illustrative example that we were also using in the article, it's on technology acceptance. You can see that here on the slide, we have two dependent latent constructs, adoption intention. So am I willing to use a certain technology and technology use, am I actually using the technology? And then in this world of technology acceptance, there are a lot of well-established models that explain what are really the drivers or the determinants of adoption intention and technology use. So we use emotional value, ease of use, usefulness and compatibility as independent or exogenous constructs that explain adoption intention and technology use. Just a few words on that. Emotional value is you are excited about the technology. It's a pleasure using it um, that will drive your adoption intention. Ease of use, it's just easy to use. Navigation is easy, menus are easy to understand. Um, usefulness, you think it's actually of use, it gives you an advantage of not using the technology or of using the technology over not using it, um, and therefore it increases your adoption, attention, and technology use. And compatibility, it fits to your lifestyle, and that's why um, a higher compatibility would produce a higher adoption, attention, and technology use. That is the conceptual model, and we had a very nice data set collected in France um, from a PhD candidate, Sandra, who was involved in the project. So that was um, the illustrative case. If we look at this illustrative case, um, we are usually in this sufficiency logic. And Sven has introduced that um, right at the beginning of this webinar. So with the sufficiency logic, we have usually a lot of well-established theories that we are going to test. We test relationships here, building on technology acceptance model, theory of consumption values, innovation diffusion theory, that are all talking about these different constructs that are part of our illustrative example. So it was rather easy for us to say, yes, the exogenous constructs are positively associated with the endogenous constructs. We could come up with some hypotheses here and that would fill up the part that we would need for our partially square structural equation model. Then the question might be, and a lot of you have already asked the question, um, is it relevant to integrate necessity logic or necessity thinking? This depends, of course, if there is an indication that necessity logic plays a role for your example, for your illustrative case that you're looking at. If there is an indication for necessity logic, so you feel, yes, it could actually be of use to analyze it. The question is, how do we actually integrate this necessity logic 
into our partially square structure equation model. And to give you some guidelines, we came up with a step-by-step -step, uh, flowchart guideline that goes through the different steps that we would recommend following for this combination of the two methods. You can see the eight steps here on the slide. Uh, the first step, and that's the, the step in all of your empirical data analysis, I would assume, is the theoretical background and the research hypothesis. You would then go on preparing and checking the data. There are some specifics that we need to look at when applying NCA in combination with PLSM that we will introduce. You can then see in step number three and four, we are pretty much in the PLS world. We run the PLS analysis and we evaluate the measurement models as a typical first steps in your structural equation uh, modeling analysis. We then could transfer the scores that we generate from PLS them over to a necessary condition analysis in R or R Studio. We run the necessary condition analysis to generate our findings on that one. We start evaluating our structural model and then we can make a combined interpretation of the results that we are generating on necessity and sufficiency logic. And now let's go through the different steps. The first step is the theoretical part. And um, usually when you look for necessity logic, we said it earlier, it's very seldom that there are already well-established theories on necessities. In many fields, however, we see that a lot of authors are actually talking about necessity. Sven and I have done a couple of reviews in the meantime, one in IB also, where we went through all the different articles and we found a lot of authors who are actually in the theoretical section talk about necessity and have a lot of necessity related arguments. A necessity related argument is also to be found in technology acceptance. We have a few authors that found, for example, that compatibility with a lifestyle may represent a necessary but insufficient condition um, for technology acceptance. Another team of authors assumes that usefulness of the technology is a prerequisite for technology acceptance. So you see again, we have some of the keywords that Sven has presented in one of his slides to identify these necessity logics. This is an indication that they are talking about necessity and there are also further studies that use, for example, qualitative comparative analysis, um, indicating some idea of necessity, but there is no well-established theory around technology acceptance yet that talks about necessity. So for our illustrative example, we kept it simple and we just said, okay, let's test it. There is some necessity thinking in the field. Let's just test whether the exogenous constructs are necessary conditions for the endogenous constructs. You can criticize that and say, Nicole, you needed to have done a much better job here in terms of the theorizing. You might be right, uh, but the focus of this illustrative example was more on the guidelines of the combinations. So still we say theory development is a challenge on the one hand side, but on the other hand side, also a chance to make a contribution because there are these arguments, but not well-established theories yet. To help you a little bit with the theorizing part, um, we decided to give you some, um, some ideas here on the slide, how you could approach that. And I think that is something that we have not so much highlighted in the article, but that's something that we are currently developing a little bit more also in the team of NCA ambassadors. A necessity logic, if you look at this kind of matrix, you have different situations and there are different things that you would need to explain if you go for a theory on necessity. The first thing here is that you need to argue why the absence of a construct, for example, usability, usefulness, causes the absence of the outcome, for example, technology use. So that is the first job that you would need to do to come up with a theoretical uh, mechanism. The second part is that you would demonstrate that in cases where the outcome is present, so where there is technology use, that there is also perceived usefulness, for example. And then the third part, and I think in my projects, at least this was the hardest part, uh, you will need to discuss why there is no substitution. So why is the um, independent constructs perceived usefulness not substituted by other things to produce the outcome technology use. And that has a lot to do with this kind of um, bi-directional character of the NCA. As Sven has introduced earlier, we do not need control terms. 
We do not um, discuss omitted variable bias. So it's really about, in terms of theory, highlighting there are no substitutes. And that could be, I would say, for some of the topics, a challenge. You have to see that for your own field. We have taken this table from a book um, on multi-method research that is talking about causality. And they are actually providing these kind of yeah, recommendations to come up with a causal theory or necessity. I found it quite useful. It's not something that is kind of written in stone. It's just an idea that we would like to present here to give you some guidance. So that would be the first part. You need to think about your theory. The second part is you need to prepare and check the data. And there were already a lot of questions that related to, for example, sampling. The good news is there are no specific requirements that are coming from the method necessary condition analysis to the sample size. You just follow the guidelines which are there in the field. If you are a combination researcher with PLSM, it would be a good idea to just follow all the guidelines that have been outlined in the PLSM context. We had a sample size of 174, but for the necessary condition analysis itself, it would work with fewer cases as well. In terms of data distribution, again, the good news, the NCA is not bound to certain distributional characteristics. Again, you can follow what is there in the PLSM context. Nothing else to look for um, when doing a necessary condition analysis. PLSM, we know that we have the experts here uh, in our webinar, um, is quite flexible in terms of data distribution. There are some discussions going on on that. Um, of course, you would need to report um, some skewness information. We have done so in the article, but there's not much of a restriction if we talk about data distribution. In terms of the preparation of the data, one of the steps that I would, from my own experience, feel would be a little bit more relevant than in the PLS world is the detection of outliers. Sven has introduced that if we have a certain outlier that is in this upper left corner in the empty space that we are looking for, we have yeah, a problem in terms of identifying necessity. So we need to ensure that this case that might be then the empty space is the true case that is maybe falsifying an idea or if it is a sampling or measurement error. So that is something that we definitely need to check and we need to do very careful when applying NCA in combination with PLSM. There are some, some generic recommendations in the literature. One of the recommendations is to look at the standardized scores above three as an indication. So you identify where are the scores that have very seldom combinations, very outlier characteristic like values. And then you would need to double check, is that a true value or is that coming from any kind of data entry error, measurement error or sampling error? In terms of measurements, Again, NCA is open to any kind of measurement. Sven has introduced these different cases. We even have had these zero one cases, that's no problem. From the PLS world, we normally use metric or quasi metric scales, very often these Likert type scales. And that was the case here too. So we used five point Likert scales, for instance, to measure usefulness or adoption intention of the technology. One of the things, um, that is very relevant at the beginning of your project is that you ensure that the coding of your scales fits to NCA. I do not know whether you remember this chart that Sven has introduced earlier where it's indicating that we have an empty space in the upper left corner here. And the idea of necessary condition analysis that it has a ceiling line and identifies this empty space. And the NCA that is implemented in our studio only looks for the empty space in the upper left corner. Theoretically, the corner can be in every yeah, kind of region of the diagram, of course, but technically the software is only looking for this empty space in the upper left corner. That is, you need to ensure that your theoretical coding of your variables will represent this situation where you would need to find the empty space in the upper left corner. To make this 100% clear, one example, we have usefulness as a um, construct or variable here, where one would be a low usefulness, five a high usefulness, one a low adoption intention, and five a high adoption intention. And we would assume 
that usefulness is necessary for adoption intention or for high adoption intention. And that is, we would look for an empty space in this corner. We would assume that we would need a high usefulness to come to a high adoption intention. So we would assume that we would have an empty space upper left. And that's exactly what we need. And that is something that you would need to ensure at the beginning of your project. Good, if you have done so, fantastic. Next step, you run the PLS them analysis. And we have not integrated um, specific information on this here because we assume that you are all PLS enthusiasts already. So you run the PLS them algorithm as you would do in any other PLS them project. Um, I have copied in here a guideline from 2019 when to use and how to report the results that could be of help. Uh, Christian can, I do not know, jump in if he has new guidelines that I should refer to, um, but that is something that you can just follow as standard for any PLSM project. Step number four, also nothing special, you evaluate the measurement models using PLSM. So you ensure that your measurements are reliable and uh, fulfill all the different quality criteria that you are familiar with from the PLSM world and uh, can then afterwards use these four in your necessary condition analysis. So actually that's quite a good combination of the two methods because NCA is not giving specific criteria to check for reliability. And you can use all of these things from the PLS world to do so. So that would be step number four. In step number five, there's again where we have the combination of the two methods. You would need to transfer scores from PLS them to your necessary condition analysis. In the PLS them model, you might have constructs that are measured in the reflective measurement mode or formative measurement mode. If you have constructs that are measured reflectively, then you would use the latent variable scores from PLS them and transfer these scores to your necessary condition analysis. That is, the necessity is tested on the level of the construct. For formative measurements, if you have an endogenous construct that you're looking at, we would recommend also doing the same thing, using the latent scores from PLS them and put them over to the NCA. So again, you look at how does the necessity impact on a certain outcome latent construct. If you have an exogenous construct that is measured with a formative measurement mode, it might be a good idea to also include the original indicators, one, two, three is given here on the slide, because then you get additional information on potential ne necessary levels that might be there on the indicator uh, level. So it's kind of a complement to looking at, or only looking at the latent construct, in addition, looking at the indicator levels here to get information where are really the necessities on the level of the construct and on the level of the indicators. As you would do in your PLS them analysis where you would look at indicator weights and make an interpretation on these weights, you could then complement this by interpreting the necessary conditions on the indicator level here. For our example, you might want to criticize that. It is very simple. We have just used reflective constructs um, and we just needed to um, transport or transfer the latent construct scores from PLS them to NCA. And this is done by exporting these scores to a CSV file, an Excel file, and then importing this Excel file to R. I do not know whether you are very often using the latent variable scores. Uh, I could assume that maybe this is not so often used um, in your typical analysis. If you're using smart PLS, which I guess is the, anyways, the best software for doing a PLS them model, but uh, maybe also the one that is most popular here in this audience, you have in the output in the PLS algorithm run, you get all the scores for the latent construct that's automatically produced. There's nothing that you have to do in addition. That's kind of an output, which is anyways there in smart. And you can see, you can copy these things to Excel. I think there's even a copy option to R. Um, we use usually these Excel format to, to import that later. So that works fantastic. 
Nicole, um, if you might, um, maybe we, we can stop here for a second um, and can explain what's what are the advantages of using this latent variables course. Um, so in the chat, we have various uh, questions about um, different uh, or, or using different scores. And maybe it's good good here before we go on with the analysis uh, to explain a little bit uh, or to go a little bit more into detail here why we suggest to use um, the latent variables course. Yeah, so sure. I mean, um, you you know that maybe from some of the projects, I do not know which fields you're working in, but maybe let's look at one example. If you are measuring a construct that, that is typical in social science or measuring or, or management, you could have something that is loyalty or that is satisfaction. Um, yeah, so you would like to measure something uh, using a question in a questionnaire. And you, of course, have the option to measure this idea of loyalty or satisfaction with one question, saying, I'm totally satisfied with the service of this company. Um, I agree from one to five, or total satisfaction is five, no satisfaction is one. Um, and you measure this with one indicator. Usually, when you have constructs that are a little bit more complex yeah, to measure, um, you would use um, multiple indicators to represent these constructs. So very often when we talk about loyalty, for example, there's something like, I would recommend the products to family and friends. Um, I feel attached to the product. Um, I would rebuy it again. So there might be different facets that could all be relevant for this idea of loyalty. And um, in, in terms of a latent construct, the, the advantage is that you can use multiple questions to represent the construct, which makes usually your measure, measurement better. You have better reliability in terms of measuring the construct. And that is a very typical approach in PLS then. Um, is also reflective versus formative something that we should um, repeat then or help me out Sven, in terms of the questions that are coming in? No, I, I, from my perspective, uh, we had a lot of <laughs> questions in the chat. It's, it's really good to see how the, how the chat evolves. Um, no, basically, I think the, the question was more, more a basic question. Um, not, not um, to use reflective formative, but should we use the latent variables course, um, which, which are calculated uh, uh, within the structure using PLS and the model, or do, you, do we use uh, additive scores, uh, um, average scores? Um, and so our suggestion would be to use latent variables scores because these latent variables scores are created within a spe specific context, namely uh, uh, the model uh, that you are um, analyzing and uh, therefore we would suggest um, to use this latent variable scores, right? The question is, is of course uh, fully there. I mean, we also discussed that when we have written the article and we have even simulated a different, different calculations for the different constructs, we use different algorithms, uh, we use the factor scores, we use kind of mean values for the constructs to see what is really the outcome for the necessary condition analysis. And yes, of course, this will change the result depending on what kind of measurement you are using. And then you can discuss what is the best way to measure the constructs. And uh, I mean, we also discussed that a little bit in team, what is now the best way forward. And we at the end decided, um, yes, we should use the composite scores from the structural equation model, because when we are interested in modeling these uh, relationships structurally in, in the model, we have a certain conceptual idea, a certain idea on associations. So we would assume um, that it's best to use the composite scores coming from this model, because this is then the best thing to complement the structural equation model interpretation. Now, of course, that can be debated. Uh, and you might have reviewers that will uh, challenge you a bit on this um, question. I mean, as, as anyways, reviewers are maybe uh, talking about whether formative or reflective is here the best me measurement approach um, for your variables. So that is something that you can discuss yourself. And if you are, I do not know if we have only a PLSM users here, but if you are a user of regression and factor analysis, for example, that could also work. You can also work with a factor score um, for the model. So it's doable. Yeah. Okay, Sven will stop me if, I'm, uh, if I need to, to repeat something. Okay, so we have the, the latent variable scores from PLSM generated in the software, and you can transfer that over to our studio. If we think about implementing the PLSM model into a necessary condition analysis, let's look at our example. 
We have here our example with two dependent constructs or endogenous constructs, and we would now need to implement these relationships to a necessary condition analysis. As highlighted before, necessary condition analysis does not have this multivariate thinking. I mean, we can use more than one variable in one analysis, but it does not change the results. So what we would need to do here for a necessary condition analysis is two NCA, one for adoption intention, so one for one of the dependent constructs and one for technology use with all the um, latent scores or constructs that are independent or exogenous construct of relevance. So it's two times necessary condition analysis for one PLS then model. Now you could say, yeah, Nicole, it's nice. You had all reflective measurements. My model might look more complex than yours. You might have a formative measurement included. What then? Let us simulate that a little bit. Let us assume you would have measured emotional value with a formative measurement construct. Then what would be the implication? The implication would be that you, in addition, integrate the three indicators of emotional value to your necessary condition analysis. You can do that in a separate step. You can integrate this into the necessary condition analysis that you are anyways performing. The results do not change no matter how many variables you integrate to the analysis. Is that understandable or is there already scream, screaming and shouting in the chat? No, that's laughing, maybe not. Okay. Running the necessary condition analysis. Now we're talking about it more than an hour and you wonder, okay, how does it actually work? Um, there is a software package for doing so in this um, statistical software R or R Studio. Um, and Jan Dull, the founding father of NCA has written a package that you can use in NCA. And the fantastic news is he has also provided a quick start guide that gives you an idea of how to install the software, which kind of codes to use and so forth. I think one of the sentences in the quick start guide says, do your first necessary condition analysis in less than 15 minutes. When I was first reading that, I thought, yeah, aha, uh -huh, of course, less than 15 minutes for an analysis, I doubt it. Um, I think it was a little bit more, but it was also not considerably more time that I needed for doing so. So it's actually really very easy to do so. I think the most uh, difficult step for me was installing the software. That was the hardest part of it. I have on the next slide copied over example codes that you use in R. So the bad news is for those of you who are used to smart PLS, um, that R Studio is less, uh, I would say, user friendly. The ease of use is lower for R Studio than for smart PLS. Um, it's a software that works with codes, so you just type in certain codes or orders or commands um, for the software to perform a certain analysis. And what you see on this slide is more or less the full code that you would need for our example. So um, again, it's really very easy to do so. Just to give you some look and feel, um, this is how um, the user interface of our studio looks. You will have here a window or menu where you put in the commands. You get here some of the results, effect sizes, and so forth. You can see here the data set that is imported to our studio, and you get some of the scatter plots automatically produced on the right hand side. So the only thing really that you need to do is install this, this R in our studio user interface, use the command lines, um, and you get what you need. Some of you might have worked with R before and say, okay, that's easy. I know how that works. Some of you might say, mm, I have never used it. And that's usually kind of a challenge to start with that. Um, one of the things that I can recommend if you have never used it before is the quick start guide from Jan. And of course, my fantastic YouTube channel uh, that I would like to promote here. You have a playlist on necessary condition analysis um, where you really have everything in terms of the basics of necessary condition analysis, the software, how to install it, how to import the data into R, how to run your first basic necessary condition analysis and so forth. In total, the videos add up to 21 minutes. And that's exactly the time, I would say, if everything runs smoothly that you would need to perform your first NCA.
Good, let us assume you have successfully managed to install the software and have run your first necessary condition analysis. And let us see what are really the results for our example. We have here adoption intention and technology use. We have here the different latent constructs that are in our PLS model, the drivers or determinants of the constructs. And we can see here the CEFDH effect sizes and the corresponding P values to see if they are significant or not. Now Sven can test whether I was attentive to his explanations. Um, he said something about the relevance and significance of the effect sizes should be above 0 0.1 yeah, to be practically relevant and it should be a significance of 5%. Fantastic, if you go through all of these numbers, you will figure out we almost have for all of our constructs necessities involved in the model. For compatibility and adoption attention, we can discuss it's significant, but it's below 0 0.1. So that's kind of a borderline thing. Um, if we fully follow Sven's guideline, we would say, yeah, okay, it might be statistically significant and it may be not so practically relevant. So that is the good news. We have a lot of necessity in our model. That's why it is a fantastic illustrative example. Let us pick two values to get a better understanding of the meaning of these things. Um, let us look at usefulness, having an effect size of 0 0.119, statistically significant, and compatibility, having an effect size of 0 0.211, also statistically significant for technology use. And I have here just copied over the two scatter plots for these two things, usefulness and compatibility, here on adoption intention, here on technology use to give you a feeling, a look and feel for what does this effect size number mean in the scatter plot. And we have introduced it earlier as always about this empty zone, this empty space that we are looking for in the scatter plot and where we can very nicely see that we have quite a large empty space here in comparison to this empty space, which is then also reflected in these two numbers of the effect size, yeah, which is the same thing, the calculation is done on this graphical area that we can see in the scatter plot. Another thing that we get from our necessary condition analysis is the bottleneck tables. Um, Sven has illustrated this nicely with the sales example earlier. So we have a bottleneck table here for adoption intention. And this is one is given in percentage ranges. Basically, you can adapt the way you want to see the bottleneck table as you want it. I have one example later. Here we have adoption intention and percentage ranges from zero to 100. That can be quite intuitive. So what do we need to do to achieve 70% of adoption intention, for example? What are the minimum levels of our independent or exogenous constructs to achieve adoption intention at a level of 70%? Let us look at our example of usefulness, just to pick one here. We would need 15.7% or let's say 16% of usefulness to achieve an adoption intention of 70% in our model. So we really have an indication on what are the minimum required levels to achieve a certain outcome here, adoption intention. The same, of course, for technology use, the same procedure. What do we need to achieve to achieve a level of technology use of 70%? An example, we would need 33.7% of compatibility or 34% to achieve 70% of technology use. And coming back to the question earlier, this is practically highly relevant information, of course, to get to know, okay, what do I need to achieve to um, make my technology use? We are currently doing a consulting project for a small company offering HR software and they are exactly interested in these levels. What do we need to perform or what are the levels we need to achieve to make our potential users, small and medium sized firms adopt our software? I tried to highlight this earlier. You can ask for bottleneck table representations in any way you want. Um, when we look at the scatter plot, we usually have the original data levels from PLS, which is using standardized scores. Um, we can see the representation of the ceiling line here. And you can actually have a bottleneck table on these actual scores. So you can ask, 
for actual numbers in the bottleneck. You can also ask for a certain number of steps that you would like to see in the bottleneck. The default usually is 10 or 11, so from zero to 100, but it's on you to design that or customize it the way you want it. And uh, we have done a couple of projects where we combine PLS and NCA. And usually um, one of the challenges from my perspective is that we have these standardized scores. So the latent variable scores are standardized and maybe it's nice either to go at for the percentage ranges. If the reviewers don't like it, um, you might have the exercise of recalculating the standardized scores back to the original scales if that is a possibility to ease interpretation later. But all of that is possible. It's just a bit of of extra work on your side. And what is nice, I would say in this representation, you can see that the bottleneck is nothing else than the, the ceiling, the stepwise ceiling line in this case, as a tabular format. Yeah, it's the same information. Good, next step, we have now run the NCA. Fantastic, we have generated some results. Next step, we are in the combination use, we would evaluate our structural model. That is, we have anyways performed the PLS them and we have generated some nice model results. And I have just brought the findings from our illustrative example here. So we can see technology use and adoption attention. We have an R square, let's comment on that in a few minutes. And we have our path coefficients indicating how relevant is, for example, an emotional value or usefulness for adoption intention and technology use, meaning so, if we have a higher cool. emotional value, we will have a higher adoption intention. If we have a higher usefulness, we will have a higher adoption intention. So that is our typical sufficiency logic interpretation of results that we are familiar with. R square, I think that was something that I've seen in the chat before I uh, took over from, from Sven. Um, R square is produced in smart PLS, telling you what is the explanatory power or how much of the variance in adoption attention or technology use is actually explained by the constructs in our model. The concept of R square is not present in necessary condition analysis. So the idea of necessary condition analysis is not about explaining variance or something. So there is no R square which is a little bit of yeah, a strange feeling for people who have worked for 10 years with R-square values. I can uh, get that. But that is something that you get from, from your smart PLS model anyway. So now what do we have? If you remember the results from the NCA, we found a lot of necessity. So we have almost all constructs being necessary conditions for the outcome. From the PLS model, we see that actually two constructs are significant determinants or drivers of adoption intention. And one is a significant driver of technology use. So we have the situation where some of the constructs are significant drivers and necessary conditions. We have the situation where some things are non-significant drivers, but necessary conditions. And there could theoretically be a situation where we have a significant driver, but no necessary condition, which is not part of our example. And I do not know if this already triggers uh, what is going on in, in my mind, at least. That's quite an interesting complementary information that we now have the two perspectives combined. We have information on necessity and uh, sufficiency, and we can talk about what are the minimum levels and where are the things where I can invest a little bit more to get a little bit higher with outcome uh, on top. Um, I have just copied over here the results in the typical tabular format. Uh, we do not need to go through all of that. One of the things that I would like to highlight is that in PLS then we might, of course, also have something such as a total effect. Let us look at emotional value being a significant determinant for adoption intention, being again a significant determinant on technology use. That is in our example, we have a total effect from emotional value to technology use that is here in our example actually significant. Yeah, so we have kind of a two-step mechanism. These things are not integrated in necessary condition analysis because there is no two-step uh, NCA at this point in time. So that's a little bit a challenge where you have to be creative and think about what to do with it. 
um, we are not yet uh, at the final stage of, of knowing what is the best way of interpreting things. Um, but just to keep that in mind, um, figure out, yes, there are some significant total effects. What does it mean for the model? And how do we compare that to necessity? Let us look at the example. Um, we have introduced three different scenarios a few minutes ago. Significant determinant and necessary condition scenario number one. Significant determinant but no necessary condition scenario number two. And non-significant determinant but a necessary condition as scenario number three. And we can then say where are our constructs actually located? And let us use two examples. We would have usefulness and compatibility. Usefulness being a significant determinant. Yes, it is significantly related to adoption intention and a necessary condition. And compatibility on technology use is non-significant for technology use, but a necessary condition. And then we had the situation that we just introduced. And what to do with these indirect total effects? We have emotional value. That is not a direct significant determinant, but has a significant total effect on technology use. Um, so we might put it in this box, but that's at the moment kind of up to you. What does this mean if we now have these different scenarios? Let us look at the two examples, usefulness and compatibility. Uh, let us use um, scenario one for usefulness. Um, we have seen earlier that there were authors saying, yes, usefulness is a prerequisite for technology acceptance. And we can say, yes, usefulness is a prerequisite for technology adoption intention. A certain level of usefulness is necessary to create intention to adopt a certain technology. And we can even specify this level that we would need from the bottleneck. That is for a high adoption intention of 70%, we would need a perceived usefulness of 16% in our situation. So far, the necessary condition analysis, plus what do we know from PLSM? A further increase of the perceived usefulness is recommended from a management perspective, as it will increase the adoption intention even further. So we really have the situation, yes, there is a minimum level that we need, plus if we increase the independent or exogenous construct further, we have the ability to also increase the outcome further. That would be scenario number one, and that is a very nice complement in the PLS then. Scenario number three is a situation where we have, uh, we look at compatibility. We find, yes, compatibility is again a necessary condition for technology acceptance, namely for technology use. And we can specify this necessity level again from the bottleneck table. We know for a high technology use of 70%, we need perceived compatibility of 34%. And in this situation, compatibility is a non-significant construct in PLS then. That is a further increase is not recommended as it will not increase the outcome further. And that is, I would say, where you immediately see that there's a nice value in combining the two methods because you get these additional insights um, from these two perspectives. Highly practically relevant and very nice to um, increase or improve theory building in many fields. These are two examples. In the article, we also offer um, kind of an interpretation guideline for three different scenarios, scenario one and scenario three are the ones that we've just seen in the example. There might be a second scenario where we have a significant determinant, but no necessary condition. And there you will have your typical interpretation and increase in the exogenous construct will increase the outcome on average. Um, and there is no minimum level that we need to ensure for the outcome to exist. Yeah, and practical projects. Um, there's a lot of, I would say, challenge going around these uh, bottleneck tables and the way of interpreting things in addition to these more generic findings that are maybe specific to the field. One of our recent articles where we also blended the use of PLSM with NCA is offering a further interpretation grid um, that helps you interpret findings from bottleneck tables. So that could be a recommended article, although it is, of course, on a very specific topic here. 
Yeah, that was what I wanted to introduce on the combined use. I do not know, Sven, how's the situation in the chat? Uh, quite, quite. No, <laughs> on the contrary. Uh, we have uh, several questions um, we, which we try to uh, address also in the, in the chat. But I think we, we should also address uh, some more um, general questions. Um, the first one is, um, Nicole, you nicely explained how um, PLS and NCA and the results can um, provide additional insights, can uh, um, provide uh, or, or address different perspective. Um, one question that came up is, um, does NCA helps us to identify which uh, are the mediators or which are moderators in our model? Do you want to uh, go ahead yeah. on that? That is a fantastic question because at the beginning of the project we thought that we would integrate a full section on mediation and how we would need to implement um, a mediation um, relationship or different forms of mediation in a necessary condition analysis. Um, I must admit, we kind of gave up for the article because we are not yet there to fully say how, what would be really the best guideline to implement a mediating relationship or moderating relationship from PLS in the necessary condition analysis. So you see, there is still some room um, for us to work on guidelines and to see what are actually best practices on these topics. Um, so it's, it's not yet there. I think Jan is discussing a mediation chain in his book on necessities, where you look at if A is a necessary condition for B, and then B is a necessary condition for C, we have something that he would call a mediation chain of necessities. Um, yeah, but it's still um, not yet fully developed, I would say, the full thinking. If you think of PLS them giving very concrete guidelines on what is a complementary uh, mediation or a competitive mediation, or full mediation, that is something that we have not yet developed in the NCA. So it's still a little bit of trial and error, I would say, for mediation. And in terms of moderation, of course, what you could do if you have a moderator, you could test if the moderating influence is necessary for something. But I must admit, this is already then quite tricky in terms of the theoretical thinking. Um, what this actually means um, as a result, if you find that a moderating term is necessary for an outcome. So we have not yet fully thought it through. That's at least my perspective. Maybe Sven has, but... Um, no, uh, <laughs> and what's, what's, what's an, an interesting thing about a necessity and applying NCA, it uh, still gives many or much room uh, for new thinking and uh, we are also learning. Um, maybe just two thoughts. Um, one for the mediation analysis. Um, still, it's about theory. Yeah. So we we um, <laughs> I continue. No theory, theory, theory. Um, so um, what Nicole mentioned is uh, necessity change uh, chains. Yeah. So uh, if you have a mediator and you think about uh, a, a chain where the mediator is, uh, or you have one X which is necessary for the mediator and the mediator is necessary for Y, which is, this is a different thinking, yeah? So in, instead of um, uh, trying to analyze if X and Y, how the relationship, the average relationship yeah, between X and Y depends on, on the mediator, can we explain the average uh, relationship uh, with the mediator? NCA does something different, yeah? NCA does uh, analyze, do you need to have a certain level for the mediator? And again, do you need, a, do you need to have a certain level of the mediator uh, for the outcome, yeah? And for moderation, still, uh, as Nicole said, it's a tricky question. So if you think about uh, moderation in terms of uh, uh, different uh, relationships between um, different groups of your analysis, uh, for example, gender. So you could think, um, yeah, maybe uh, we have a gender moderates um, our relationships. Um, if you think about uh, moderation and necessity thinking, you need to consider that um, what you do, uh, you still have your bivariate analysis. And um, if you uh, separate your analysis uh, for male and uh, female, you will, um, reduce uh, the cases you have. So uh, the scatter plot for male and uh, female will look different. So, and so the um, ceiling lines for male and female will be different. And uh, probably what will happen is that the, the necessity will increase because um, you have fewer cases. Yeah, Just one thought on that. I mean, that's, that's quite tricky. As Sven said, we had one project where we're looking at different factors from, from the HR perspective and we had data for different countries. 
And then we found that in some countries, a certain practice is a necessary condition, whereas it is not in other countries. And I thought, okay, maybe it's not a big problem. We can use it as an exercise and simulate that a little bit. And then Jan said, yeah, actually, it could be a problem because of the theory that would then indicate that it's not really a necessary condition in a very strict uh, sense. Because in the, in the necessity thinking, the idea is that there are no substitute. It must be there for the outcome to, to exist or to manifest. And uh, here we then would talk about a contextualization. Um, and yeah, that's part of, of the theorizing, which is not yet uh, fully developed. So that makes it a little bit tricky uh, in practical projects. So at, at the moment, we kind of refrain from integrating an example on, on moderator and, and mediation for certain reason. You can see you got us here for our illustrative case. Okay, um, can I add one thought? Because I see another question in the chat. So. Uh, can uh, NCA represent causality? I had a slide on that. And I think uh, we also had earlier a question about uh, causal interference. And um, no, NCA, NCA cannot guarantee causality. I tried to explain it. Uh, so again, yeah, if we want to have uh, established causality, yeah, the cause needs to precede the outcome, etc. cetera. So um, NCA is not no guarantee for that. So depends on the data, it depends on the analysis, uh, and uh, NCA is, is no guarantee for, for causality. Should okay, maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, I have a few Fine. slides that um, should give you some guidance, and I can see we are almost already done with the time also, which is uh, good that I come to the end. Um, so we have a few slides that provide you with information on potential sources of support to follow up on your own NCA and PLSM projects. Um, there's a website that is specifically targeting the NCA community that is at the University of Rotterdam, Erasmus University of Rotterdam. Um, you can see the link to the website here. It's providing all information on NCA, on publications. Um, there's a calculator on the website for a quick and dirty NCA that you can perform. But actually, as it is really very easy to do that in R, uh, I would say, if, yeah, calculator might be nice, but um, go for the R package and, and do your own MCA. That's really fairly easy. Um, here we have the link to the quick start guide that we were talking about that is also available on the website. I have promoted my YouTube channel already. Uh, I will do that here once more. It's a good channel to look and understand MCA. There are some social media sites Sven and I are not so active in the social media otherwise, but Jan in Rotterdam is, and of course Christian is as well. So Christian, I think, will, will link all of these information for the PLS community, plus you will have the relevant social media sites from the NCA community here. Yeah, we have a few slides that's in the slideshow just for you, for the website, the calculator, the software, we have introduced that. You have seen the quick start guide, I do not need to repeat that, I have promoted my channel. Uh, that is obviously how Facebook looks um, from NCA. Um, let me just highlight two more things before we can open up for, for more Q&A. Um, there are two upcoming um, webinars or offers. Uh, one is an NCA webinar that we are offering in UNSE at the University of Southern Denmark. It's a two-hour webinar. Um, it's pretty much, uh, I would say, relevant for those people who have not been here today but still have an interest to get an introduction to NCA. So maybe not for you, but for your fellow colleagues. Um, again, offering a foundation, you have the relevant links on the um, event and on the registration. It's for free, so feel free to join. In addition, there is a summer course. So this is a full week course held in June and offered by Jan Duhl and um, I think some of his team members. Um, it is even providing one ECTS. I think if there are some of you who still need to collect some ECTS points for whatever reason, um, you have more information via this link and you can register here. And I think that this course is actually not for free. I think it was about 250 euros um, as, a, as a fee that you would have to pay um, for participating in here. Yeah, let's jump in into Q&A, open up for discussions. I mean, we have in between already tried to answer some but maybe there are further questions. Um, and I think I will stop the slideshow and I can see you better and also follow what is going on in the chat. Yeah, 
Thank you, Nicole. And uh, I would also say, please feel free to raise your questions. We have tried to keep track of, of the chat. Uh, Nicole in the first part and, and many others, uh, Christian, uh, Marco, Wangu, many people were engaged. However, I'm sure we missed some questions. And uh, um, if you uh, feel free, please feel free to, to raise these questions. Um, if not, I, I would always offer, yeah, we are all people in engaged uh, and, and interested in, in uh, moving also forward and uh, your questions can also help us um, so feel free to also contact us afterwards um, regarding NCA regarding PLS but uh, Christian Marco is this going on here <laughs> um, Okay, I think uh, before we go into the Q&A, I should switch the video recording off, right? So people might be afraid to ask questions. So I stop the video here. And okay. uh, just to finish uh, um, the official part, um, let's say thank you very much. Uh, this was Prelude uh, uh, PLS 2022, Prelude session number two. And um, we are definitely uh, going ahead uh, with a series of presentations uh, coming ahead of um, the PLS 2022 conference in Beijing. And uh, this is certainly something I like uh, to promote here. And if you like further information on the next preload sessions, um, we will um, definitely post it on the PLS 2022 webpage. Um, so that is uh, for now. Thank you very much. And I switched the video off here, the recording.